Well, um, first of all, I want to thank James. He has been an incredible proponent of this space and um, really a, a wonderful opportunity to speak to all of you about uh, what our vision here at NextStim is. I'm a little back in my I'm a uh, interventional pain physician, uh, been practicing for six plus years and um, really enjoy the practice of pain. But um, in my prior uh, training, I was a MD PhD who took the gluttony for punishment to do these long protracted uh, dual degrees. But in the process, um, I was really able to spend my first um, startup experience in the semiconductor industry in quantum and drug delivery. Um, you know, I, I think that for most of these entrepreneurs that are presenting to you today, I can't stress the importance of true mission that um, sets the foundation for the culture, the belief, in how we spend them and um, what we think we want to accomplish. And one of the things that really I, I take away is I was born in the southern tip of and part of the challenge with um, the amount of new technology we create in the development really penetrating the poor access points all over the world is this fundamental concept that you know not all of these technologies really lend themselves to accessing the communities that we really want them to um, i've been a very passionate uh, advocate of the pain space but i come back to a very simple question why do we do the things that we do and, and part of that for me is when you look at as a practicing physician um, today the bill that we generate on an implantable um, therapy and look at uh, what started in the 1960s to all of the randomized controlled trials, the billions of dollars being spent in getting the market primed with new technology focusing on the missing pieces at the end of the day, that bill is about $100,000. The reality is when you look at the market penetration for such a promising therapy like neuromodulation, it's under 4%. And so what really is the mission for NextStim beyond what you're going to, I'm going to present our first FDA approved device that has gone for three months, but the case that we're going, we shift the paradigm in that thinking. We want to really focus on at the end of the day, great B has to be able to penetrate the global market, penetrate a greater population of patients. Give you a statistic today in the, in the United States, there's about 50.2 million Americans with chronic pain. And we on average do about 100,000 implants a year. So clearly there is a huge dis in the way that the technologies are created and versus committed to access larger population of folks. So at the heart of the fundamental belief that the, the equation to really solving or having a more comprehensive pain management starts with rethinking about patients and the physician interaction much more holistically. We under clinicians will tell you no matter how the technology is, there's no panacea that creates a 100% solution. And part of the reason is that there is an entire psychosocial component to the dynamics that patients that come into a chronic pain clinic have, whether it's the environment, the cultural context, whether it is in understanding the needs that they come in. And part of the, the mission statement for really Nextim is to come together as a campaign that's focused not just on our initial devices, but really the larger digital community looking at monitoring as a component of that and really changing the paradigm between how patients and physicians should be interacting in a much more holistic um, global way. So this is Echo AI. This is our first FDA approved um, neuromodulation unit that's based on called AI technology. And I think you're gonna appreciate probably through many presentations today about the future, um, now starting to really inch into the neuromodulation space. And about three years ago, we had this marching mission that National Institute of Health was heavily invested in trying to create a low cost solution to ability for neuromodulation really target a larger demographic or practice. So when you think about what this is, is really the ending that we, we think field stimulation has had a tremendous benefit, like number of patients that actually, if you look at what the data was in the late 70s to 80s, um, there was a growing benefit to local monitoring 
really back, neck, shoulder, and knee pain, which make up about 90% of the demographic. The innovation cycle that has completely stopped for the last 20 to 25 years for obvious reasons that the focus has really shifted the implantable. But also with that, we've understood a lot about what is the science of field uh, and the understanding around field stimulation, specifically with large, uh, we ran a 200 patient RCT um, through NIH. And what we discovered from that is certain biphasic stimulation patterns can be very effective in upregulating endogenous opiate levels, as well as serotonin levels. And what was fascinating is that there is some amount of tachyphylaxis that develops over a short 24-hour uh, window. So short co courses of stimulation that can be targeted and, and to some extent using a big data algorithm where a lot of you who have seen me speak on the podium, the big challenge is the conversion of our randomized controlled trials to real world evidence has really suggested that we may have to rethink that paradigm. And we put that all together to what I define as the Echo AI device. And today we're just um, looking at the commercial um, traction. We've now logged in close to about 100,000 minutes in the last three months um, with a compliance rate over 90%. So the second part of this is that our pipeline, we will be launching our second product called Echo W this coming March, April, that will be looking at rapid integration of data like heart rate variability, um, EKG, blood pressure, monitor, uh, blood pressure monitoring, sleep monitoring, as well as um, actual functional outcome. Now, make no mistake, the entire interventional pain space has been heavily looking to become and create more objective outcomes. And what we are essentially doing is creating one complete uh, ecosystem and paradigm where the actual data sets will all be integrated into a simple EMR compatible as well as a standalone dashboard that can be viewed by our physicians. We are not abandoning the belief that the future does require some amount of implantable and really the, the true test of innovation and the engineering um, that's come from that is that today we've rethought, we have rethought about Nextim as really the new battery level manufacturing company of the future. The way we're going to do that today is that we have created a battery that we think is an implantable at one uh, on about a 0.5 cc volume compared to now the current industry standard like the Intellis platform around 13.5 cc's. So you can imagine that all of these devices will be integrated in the same software um, they will be running off your iPhone and your platform. And the whole idea here is by miniaturization, um, and we're looking at a probably one, one to entry into the market, our ability to cut the cost as well as reduce the overall burden of neuromodulation and allow for scalability is really going to be a part of the future. So from a simple practical perspective, Echo AI is a very simple device in terms of the user interface to the patients. It's meant to be a rechargeable lithium ion six hour battery cycle that typically will give you a three to five year battery life, as well as the actual interface on the iPhone is compatible, was FDA approved. And you can see kind of the uh, different features on the bottom panel that include things like community, things like things that we want that encourage the patient to think more holistically about the interface with other patients that are there. Um, it has an intensity, it has a battery life, and as well as a, we looked at the science of short durable therapy really being important in minimizing this kind of tachyphylaxis that develops. So this, again, you would look at both an iPhone success as well as an Android platform for um, downloading it. Um, this is actually the first gen of this, so we made the user interface pretty simple, but of course, for every iteration, um, we will be expanding. And what's really the beauty of this is similar to any other modern day uh, silicon tech company, we're able to create updates across all of our user platforms across the world, um, and it makes it very facile to update the app as needed for any new um, actual advancements that we would see in terms of both the wave as um, specifically to the app in terms of the user interface. Um, so what happens is the typical patient will register their um, information and they will start a new session. 
and at which point the um, actual device will guide them through the process of where in the body part they will be placing it. And again, this is based on not just an aggregate data of the user input that they individually give. The power of big data and really AI ML is the ability to reference thousands and thousands of data points across um, multiple providers in multiple parts of the world. Again, one of the most impressive things is that it's a simple interface without the wires, without the cumbersome, in fact, makes it very facile patients to be using this during uh, times of activity. Um, we do have now what we call remote patient monitoring setting, but that will essentially any practice that works with Nextim will officially have a clinic identifier code that will link all of the patient's data in a closed fashion in that practice to the dashboard that we create for that individual practice. And this is really at the heart of what allows us to do the remote patient monitoring as well as the um, billing that um, is very well established across both Medicare, Medicare Plus, as well as many private insurances that we're now starting to see a lot of the EOBs coming back. And um, again, the user interface looking at, since this is really a field stimulation as well as an electromyographic stimulator, um, it can do a lot of the strengthening as well as the relief functions that we see, as well as, you know, certainly consideration for athletic and or um, patients that are looking for rapid recovery post uh, acute injury, um, they can certainly use some of the different programs. So we started with almost close to 160 uh, programming parameters, and we've gone to what we say 30 to 35 of the most um, frequently used systems or uh, program algorithms that are um, very effective. So um, obviously the idea here with Echo AI is to replace the idea uh, uh, the what we think is the front end of majority of physicians that are thinking about neurostimulation as a palliative option, we are going front and center at targeting PT and conventional pain and saying, let us think about an electroceutical solution at the front. Think about all of these different opiates. Why can't we redefine Electrosuit was a their option. So the dashboard had to, when we created it and really at the be meaning clinically appropriate, legally compliant, and scalable. So this is I'm gonna best uh, remote patient monitoring dashboard in terms of HIPAA compliance, ease of use, as well as um, really optimizing for personalized stimulation. Uh, we think we are at the front end leading the pack in terms of really being the pioneering group in terms of introducing RPM, which is going to be a very important market, uh, consistently shown to have incredible clinical and commercial benefit in the cardiac and diabetes space. We think we've solved that and are continuing to expand our market penetration uh, throughout the pain community and to really the larger um, ecosystem of RPM as a therapy modality. And so when we designed this dashboard, we were hyper compliant to look at minutes spent on the dashboard and the data that we are starting to collect. It can be very interesting in terms of both the physiologic uh, outcomes that it would provide in terms of um, by March, we'll be integrating the entire component of sleep, function, uh, heart rate variability as long. And in addition to where in the stimulation you're doing, what types of programs you're using, as well as looking at longitudinal data for each individual make patient. Make no mistake, this is absolutely going to be game changing for the pain. You're recognizing is earlier intervention makes a huge impact in not just the quality, I think also changing the demographic of seeing less of the repeat patients in a practice on new patients that may help the cost savings to the health system overall it's you know, tremendous impactful because the traditional sense is you have a patient that's not doing well they're unaware they go to the ed they end up going and it's a huge sink in terms of the cost of the to the healthcare setting in both a small practice all the way to big large health systems and so you can see that even the longitudinal data that we collect there's a lot of meaningful value to just knowing even simple body locations for where patients are stimulating. They may start with shoulder and end up stimulating the knee or and or different parts of the bodies that may better triage those patients that practice at a future later date. 
So what we recognize is an incredible, powerful way to use data to better understand who are these pain patients that are coming in and how best to start thinking about we're all whether today it's a electroceutic to future products that are going to be implantables, who is the right patient for these? Um, again, going back to these four sets of codes, very well established, and the reimbursement actually is only going to continue to increase and established a system that is completely integratable to the practice. So we are able to generate the super bills for the practice. We also set up all of the RPM codes so that um, those bills are consistent every month. We end up also able to provide monitoring services to the practices. We train them on the clinical all the way to the front end. So why is stress this is unlike any other company out there, we believe in the partnerships with the practices that we work with. And we are truly a one-stop solution to um, re really looking at that as a ecosystem integration. Um, again, these are the super bills that are generated. So just to give you a, an, in, in some statistics, in the last three months into commercial launch, we've logged in close to 100,000 country, um, about 16 uh, well-known clinics nationally, and we're continuing to onboard about five to 10 practices a month. And what's incredible is the um, device compliance is reaching close to above 90%. And what I'll you is if you look at any other traditional devices out there that are even suggestive of anything that looks monitoring, we're looking about a 45 to maybe a 50% compliance. So clearly patients are having a tremendous benefit therapy value to the device, but also the consistent use of it really gets into the um, mechanisms of the financial compensation to the practices, as well as the different uh, business models that we are um, essentially endorsing in terms of getting this um, into a commercial setting, as well as um, the compliance of our devices for remote patient monitoring. So I will give you one example of how powerful this was. This is a patient on permission from Dr. Singh, who's the vice chair and professor at Cornell Spine. Um, this was an 80-year-old female with thoracic myofascial pain, had uh, prior interventional treatments that it included an epidural, trigger point, intercostal phenol blocks, erectrospinae blocks, um, had a multiple left-sided radiofrequency ablation, was on high doses of oxycodone, soma, and Lyrica prior to echo AI. After echo AI, and this was just within a three-month window, she was off all opiates, off the Lyrica, using Mobic intermittently, and hasn't actually required any further interventional requirements. So we've been tracking her uh, remote patient monitoring data, as well as we're seeing a complete reduction in the intensity usage over time. So this in conjunction with the seamless communication has made a super huge impact in terms of um, really making sure that the patient is doing well, but it's changed the way that Dr. Singh and the patient are interacting. So I have a very nice patient testimonial video. The patient has given me permission to share this, and I'm going to play this for you as the conclusion of my talk, but certainly I'm open to any small segment of that. It's recording. You don't have to say your name or anything because it'll be shown there. Okay. So a little bit about your experience with Echo AI and next him tens It's been a remarkable experience for a long time. I've been dealing with pain. And when I started using this device, it's given me a great deal of now last night at around six o'clock at night, I had on a one to 10, I would say an eight level of pain. And I put the device on and within maybe five minutes, I began to feel better. And by 20 minutes, I felt ever so much better. So it's been a very positive experience for me. Tell us about how easy it is to use with the app, even as you know, some people are not so technologically savvy. How difficult is it to app or how much have you kind of come along? Okay, so I'm not technologically savvy. 
and initially I needed support. Dr. Singh gave me support. All the people and they gave me support. And then the third strand of support, a young man actually came to my home and talked me through using the device and it was very much better for me. You mentioned earlier that you are excited to see the potential of this device. What did you mean by that? So given my age, I'm not innovative when it comes to technology, but it occurred to me that there are so many aspects of the device that I'm just so up to Dr. Singh said, could I be doing more? And he said, sure. And help me gave me three favorites that I can easily access. And I can't wait to get home and to try them. I'm not sure whether I should do one favorite and maybe you, the audience, don't know what favorites are, but this is a remarkable thing, this artificial intelligence. Through my phone, I can access a program that is established and that Dr. Singh has access to also. So there can be a, so to speak, discussion between Dr. Singh and myself, and in a, in a way, between the device and myself. So tell, tell us a little bit about what you think about this remote patient monitoring. You know, the beauty of this feature is that you can use the device and I get information about you without much effort in terms of you calling my office and trying to get in touch with me. I know how hard that is. What do you think about this remote patient monitoring and what do you see the value of that might be? I think it's tremendously valuable because we all know that we're at a period of time medically where it's very difficult to get in touch with your physician. And through this, it, it's almost like everything is virtual. I can have the input from Dr. Singh and Right. Okay, just being mindful of time. I know that the interview probably goes for another five, two, three minutes, but um, at this point, I'm open to any questions. Um, I know that we had a total of 15, 20 minutes, but uh, thank you very much and really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what we have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Krishnan. Christian, I know you're remote, uh, but I wanted you to know that that was a thunderous applause uh, in, in the room. Um, I have a question, but I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen only because, not that we don't want to uh, see your email address there, but um, uh, we were getting a little bit of bandwidth, and the bandwidth problem is on your end, it's not on our end, because... Um, um, uh, oh, there you are, in person, right. So... Um, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but I know that Stefano had a question uh, as well. So, so Stefano, do you, if you're with us, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Coming in fine. So, Christian, you know, thanks for the, uh, the presentation. I was interested to know, you know, how you're going from, uh, you know, the tense approach with, you know, external devices uh, to the to an IPG, you know, device and how that fits. You know, within your strategy, I, I was, you know, that was hard to me for for me to understand. You know, uh, and and you know, if you can maybe elaborate on that, and you know, is is that that have to do with you know, uh, you know, I guess maybe something related with the uh, to the IP or you know yeah. the way data is processed. I mean, I I, I didn't quite follow that uh, you know process to go from external to uh, uh, to an implantable. So re really good question. So we we have the intellectual property today being able to design 
battery IPGs and devices at about a 0.5 cc volume. And the idea here though, is that the future in terms of how do we create an ecosystem that's similar to the way the software industry has seen so much of um, classic example, why the, the attraction with Apple is what you see the iPhone connected to the iMac that's connected to the iWatch and everybody's on the same set of cloud type um, and in, in the same way, we believe that as we look at our non-invasive devices that continue to have a significant penetration. So in the last, um, you know, three months, we've onboarded about 500 patients. And we started this conversation that's about 100,000 implants a year. We are looking at a million to patients being able to on the same network. So the challenge in the implantable space is that as you collect the data, find the patient for the implantable. And part of that is what makes this so powerful is as you collect that data, you are going to have the interface a direct consumer pipeline where uh, clinics are going to be partnering with Nextim and allowing us the ability to decide who is a good candidate for that. And certainly, um, you know, making the next step in this is a low cost implantable and make no mistake, we are going to get this down to such a radically different call, call point that it is going to change the market landscape. There is going to be no further $100,000 implantable. With that size and that miniaturization, you're talking about really market expansion and numbers and getting costs down to under a grand. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, Thank you. I've heard that. <laughs> Oh, uh, on Zoom, who has You see anyone? Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions in the room. Uh, Lothar? So any plans for prospective uh, clinical trials to get uh, clinical evidence for your claims? Um, yes, we are collecting active data. Um, we are active. And we're going to launch this very shortly. The, the beauty of something like this is also, you can imagine we are a software data company too. So we're going to actively publish all of the outcomes that we have been accruing for um, the 500 plus patients. Um, but we are also looking at kind of reinvigorating the market with, we ran the kind of through NIH, the double blind placebo control trial um, but both for any of the implantables as well as their future uh, tech devices, we will be generating that clinical data ongoing and publishing it. Certainly, I, I can tell you from a large enterprise accounts and insurance carriers, it's very powerful because now talking in tens of thousands of data points as opposed to a control, control trial. Okay. Uh, Krishna, I was going to ask you. Um, and the whole idea of Echo AI sounds very uh, intriguing. The idea of collecting data and making a uh, presumption when and where to deliver, that's, that's uh, exciting. But as you know, uh, um, other firms you know, have made claims about introducing AI into neuromodulation. In fact, just recently, uh, NevroCorp got FDA approved their uh, SCS system. So can you uh, talk a little? Yeah. So, you know, differ the, from yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, hundred percent. So AI, ML, everybody loves to throw the buzzword, but the fact of the matter is that part of what makes AI powerful is the ability to collect large amounts of data. So the reality is that it's nice to say that, hey, we may have a robust system that's run by AI when you think about traditional spinal cord stim with Nevro, but it's the same problem that we're all running into, which is at the end of the day, when you think about the cost of that battery at $21,000, $21, you're going to be able to, uh, to collect meaningful. Here, imagine tomorrow your big day, millions, and that does is it better inform decision point for how do you use learning way more effectively to optimize therapy because the data the outcomes of AI ML is completely dependent that you put in and it needs a broad data to be much more effective and we've seen that 
in the radiology space, we've seen the oncology space. So um, we're excited about this because our device today is free to the patient. It is free to the patient and the, it, the cost of it is $200. There is wow. no competing with that today. Market non-invasive, free to the patient, $200. We are in the moment, in my opinion, and I think we're going to be leading it. Okay. Well, uh, Christian, I think that's all the time we have. I want to say thank you very much for your uh, presentation, and hopefully you can join us for, uh, we have two more sessions coming up uh, this afternoon.